Okay, we are going to, um, I want to uh, welcome um, Samara and Marsha and um, Allison. Um, we are <clears throat> committee going to um, turn our focus back to uh, H171. Um, and we have uh, <clears throat> the up and I'm, and we have the opportunity, did I miss anyone who is, okay. When we have the opportunity to hear from we actually have four people on our um, <clears throat> committee witness list to uh, provide us with some feedback and answer some questions that we um, gave them as it relates to uh, the childcare. Um, so, um, <clears throat> Allison, um, thank you for uh, coming to uh, our committee. Um, Really appreciate it. Good to see you. And um, <clears throat> if you can take yourself off mute and um, don't know if you are starting first with comments or um, some prepared testimony or um, you want us just to begin papering, you know. <laughs> sure. Um, thank you so much, Madam Chair. And thank you all for inviting me here today. Um, and thank you for sending questions that helped to <clears throat> condense what I wanted to share with you today. Um, they were all very good questions and I'm so excited that you are looking at this bill so deeply and intensely. Um, so I'm just gonna dive right into answering the questions if that's okay with you. Uh, it certainly is, but if you could introduce oh, a um, if you could, um, to you and to, to everyone else who is here, if you could introduce yourselves when you come, when you start to speak, um, because we are on, not, um, we are on tape and we are on YouTube. Um, and um, if we don't have our agenda up, people not, may not know who you are or um, from what position, from what place are you uh, um, providing testimony. Sure, sorry about that. Yeah. My name is Allison Grisb, and I am the director of the Bennington Early Childhood Center down in Bennington, Vermont. And I join you here today with my director's hat on. So um, you asked if I believe that advanced degrees are important for childcare providers to hold early childhood educators, as I like to say, and what is my own practical experience. Um, I absolutely believe that advanced degrees are important. Um, I myself uh, started with a bachelor's degree in psychology and then started working with young children and quickly realized I wanted to learn more and went back and got my master's degree in early childhood education and also got my teaching license through the peer review process. Um, but that being aside, in my center, as well as in many other centers throughout the state, I know Head Start programs, um, public pre-K programs that are in elementary schools, we all are already requiring that our lead teachers have bachelor's degrees, maybe not in early childhood education, but at least a related field. I know that's not the case for all programs, but there are many programs out there that are already doing that. And in my ideal world, I believe all te lead teachers should have bachelor's degrees. <clears throat> I know that's a big jump from where we are now, so I'm not suggesting that we immediately jump to that, but I think it's something to work towards. Um, but I also recognize that it's really hard to recruit these folks to work in our programs because the pay is so low and the benefits are severely lacking. Um, and there are also some people working in the field who have been doing this for many, 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 many years, and they are just naturally great at working with children and they don't have degrees. And I don't want to disrespect them at all, but it's my experience that advanced degrees do make us even better teachers. And I have an example to share for you. I have a teacher that I hired about five years ago and she did have a bachelor's degree, but in a totally unrelated field although she did have some experience working with children and a passion for working with children. But since starting to work for us, 
she went back to graduate school and um, started working towards her master's in early childhood education. And it was, it's been wonderful to witness the enormous growth in her quality of teaching since she started taking those advanced classes. Um, it, it's, it was like, you could track it. She was a great teacher to start with, but she's a fabulous teacher now that she has these other classes under her belt. One of our biggest hurdles that we face as early childhood programs though, is that um, once folks are working with us and then they continue their education and get their teaching licenses, they often move on to public, the public school system where the pay is significantly better for the same work. So that's my take on, on advanced degrees and why I believe they're important in early childhood education. Next, you asked um, if we accept families who utilize the state's child care assistance. Yes, we do at my program. And do we have a cap on the limit of number of children from those families that we take? No. Um, and in fact, over the years, that number has grown and grown. If changes in H-171 that expand childcare financial assistance to lower income and middle income families, or would, the, would changes improve access to childcare at my program? Yes, I think this would make a huge difference. Currently, families that only qualify for partial subsidy or just miss the cutoff are really, really struggling to pay their tuition. To alleviate their financial burden, some of them are, are being crafty with their hours that they attend care. They might only come four days instead of five days, or they might come seven hours a day instead of eight hours a day to um, cut back on their tuition and make sure that the subsidy that we're getting covers it. Other people, um, a couple of the families in my care have resorted to um, asking grandparents to help pay their tuition because they're just not able to cover it on their own, even though they don't make the cutoff for financial assistance. Um, one parent has said to me that she feels like every time she does something to better her life, like accepting a promotion at work, it ends up hurting her more financially because then she doesn't get the, the benefits that she needs and she ends up paying more out of pocket. So I believe an expansion of CCFAP, both in how many families are being reached and in the depth of that assistance would significantly assist a great many families at my program and other programs. Next, you asked what would, impact, what would the impact of being paid based on enrollment versus attendance? have at my program? Well, when a regularly paying family, not one that receives um, financial assistance, if their child is out sick for a week or they go on vacation for a week or a couple weeks during the year, they still pay for that slot. And it, with childcare financial assistance, um, you might get a few sick days or a few vacation days, but after a certain point, you don't get paid for those days we should get paid for those days because we're still holding the slot for that family. So if we could get paid based on enrollment versus attendance, it could have a significant impact on programs, especially those programs that have a high number of families who receive financial assistance. When we submit our programs information to the state for, market, for the market rate survey, you asked, how do we do that? I submit um, what our maximum tuition is for a week of care. We're open from 7.30 to 5.30 every day. So what would that maximum figure be? The problem is that that doesn't truly cover the cost of care. We know that parents can't afford to pay more, so we can't increase our tuition more but the actual cost of care, especially if we were to pay our staff what they are actually worth, 
is way more than what we charge. So that market rate isn't, um, isn't accurately portraying the true cost of care. Then you asked if our program takes children under the age of three, which we do, what does a typical day look like? Well, when our children arrive, uh, things are a little different now during COVID restrictions. So <clears throat> they get dropped off at the front door and we bring them down to their room and wash hands and get them settled and they play. They explore materials, they play for a long time. Then they might go through a round of diaper changes, have their morning breakfast snack, go outside, um, have a gathering circle time. You might think that sounds strange to have a circle time for kids that young, but they do. They come together and sing and read stories and play instruments. Um, then there might be some more indoor play time, another round of diapers, lunch time, nap time, another round of diapers, the afternoon snack, and then more outdoor play before they head home for the day. I thought you were gonna say another round of diapers, sorry. <laughs> There's a lot um, of diaper changing. <laughs> I'm sorry, Allison, as you're talking, I'm trying to, um, you take um, children under three. Yes. Um, at what age do you start taking children? I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble with the concept of my six month old being in circle time. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, um, so I, I, I'm, I'm so I, and, and you may not take, you may not right. take that, that may be a different, um, that, that may be not, 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 not children. We, we start with, we start with one year olds. You start with one year olds. Okay. So, so they're a little bit older and yes, it's, I mean, it's, it's not exactly the same as calling your four and five year olds over to sit on the rug and having a 20 minute time where you're doing calendar and um, weather and a story and song and activity. It's more like the teacher is singing and she, it, it's so engaging that the children want to go and be near her and, and, play with her and do instruments and um, finger plays and stuff like that. And if they don't come over, then they don't come over. But um, there is a time that she designates for uh, that sort of activity. And up until, up until a few years, maybe five or six years ago, we only started at age two but we had such a need for, um, especially for some of the families in our program that had uh, second children, second or third children, um, there was such a need for one-year-olds that we opened a one-year-old classroom. So next you asked, um, what do I think about the concept of the state setting the lowest amount you would be allowed to pay an employee of your program? First, I wanted to say that early childhood educators definitely need to be paid more than they currently are, especially those that have education under their belt. It's, it's pretty crazy that someone with a bachelor's degree or master's degree might only be making $15 an hour. If those CCFAP rates increase significantly, then this might be able to be a reality. And maybe it would be helpful if the state sent, set benchmarks for those who have various levels of training. For example, those with an AA degree would not make less than such and such amount. Those with BA degree, bachelor's degrees would not make less than. Those with master's degrees or teaching licenses would not make less than. Possibly. But I think the, the most important piece is that we need to be paying our workers more and increases to CCFAP could make that happen. Next you asked um, if I could identify one thing that the state could do to improve our interaction with them and support our business and the children. And the first thing that came to my mind was updating the Bright Futures information system, which I know has been talked about and I think is in the works. Um, but that would be huge, especially if those updates 
um, were to make the system easier to navigate and um, more streamlined. What is one thing that the state should stop doing? I think that the state should stop trying to make Band-Aid fixes and throwing a little money here, a little money there, patching things up in bits and pieces. I think what we need is a big systemic change that acknowledges the work we are doing um, by saying it's both valued and supported. And that would likely be financially supported. And what is one thing that the state should keep doing? I think communication is key. The more the workforce feels as though it's being kept in the loop and listened to, the better. And I hope that um, those that helped to answer some of your questions and that it will help you uh, keep pushing this bill on further. Do you have any questions for me? Thank you. Thank you, Allison. I'm going to open it up to committee members. Uh, Representative Brumstead. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Allison, for your comments and stories. I, I love to hear about the, the woman who went back to school and then um, what were their next steps? So interesting. I, I'm curious about one of the things during um, COVID, we were, when the COVID relief funds were here was we had put money aside for um, centers to apply for money to do special projects that would either open up access or um, help with some of the COVID needs that centers had. And I wondered how that process went for you and if you were able to ask for some of those funds out of that. I think that the uh, DCF set up a fund that people applied into. Yes, we were able to access, um, every time there were funds available, we were able to access them. We continued to provide essential care throughout the closure period. So we um, were serving the children of essential workers. And then once we were able to open up to more workers did so. And at that time, um, the CDD offered uh, restart grants to get things going again. We did take advantage of that. That was a very easy process. The next um, round of funds was the operational relief grants. That one was a little bit trickier. We had to show that we had a loss in income or that we had um, increases to expenses and we had to, you had to prove that. Um, I did apply for that as well and did receive that, but that was a little um, trickier of a process to go through, but not, not too hard. But it helped with creativity of different ways that you could maybe, for, I'm just thinking for future ideas of ways for people to have more children or more program. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of places are limited in how many children they can serve, right? We have, um, licensing restrictions. Um, but we also, there, there are also other types of restrictions. For example, my program um, being not on a uh, sewer line, a city sewer line, we have a septic system. And so our wastewater permit, which you get from the state, limits us to how many people can be in the building at one time. And so we actually cannot expand any bigger than we already are. So, and I know other people have restrictions like that as well. We That's certainly right. would expand if we could. Thank you. And we have a, um, a question from uh, Representative Redmond. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a question, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the age old problem of, um, uh, people investing in their education, getting their master's, and then um, losing them to the public school system. And I'm wondering, you know, we're talking about um, more subsidy of CCFAP and the fact that that subsidy would, would help toward going toward wages and kind of raising those wages. But I'm wondering if you feel the plan on the table and what we're discussing is adequate to somehow 
stem that issue. You know, I, I, I'm really wondering how, you know, with everything that we're talking about and doing, will we be able to, you know, kind of chip away at that issue of, of teachers leaving and going, you know, to place where they have really good benefits. And that's what I want to do is, is create a plan where we can keep those folks. I mean, ultimately it may not be in the short term, but over the long term. That's a great question. And I liked that you used the term chip away, because I think this is something that needs to be done. It, it needs to be um, planned for, but done in baby steps. You can't just all of a sudden say, yeah, we have millions of dollars for you. Here you go. I think it's going to take some time to build up to that, but setting the infrastructure in place for um, a plan is a great step. And I think that a lot of people really like working in a private child care program as opposed to the public school and really like working with that under five age group. So it's not so much a matter of wanting to leave, um, but sometimes it's financially necessary. And I think if we can get to a point where, where people are at least seeing that we're making progress, it's going to help keep people um, where they want to be. Are there other questions for Allison? Allison, thank you. Thank you for taking time from all those kids um, and speaking to us. It's been very helpful. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, next, we have uh, Christy Swenson. Hi, Christy. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. Appreciate well, thank you. Thank you. And um, uh, do you have prepared remarks or do you want us to paper you with questions? <laughs> I, I can introduce myself and say a little bit about Head Start because I'm here um, to represent Head Start. And, and then you can pepper me with questions. <laughs> okay. So my name is Christy Swenson and I'm the director of Capstone Head Start, which serves Lamoille, Washington and Orange counties. And um, all, of, all of Vermont is served by various Head Start programs. There are seven Head Start programs that, that cover the length and breadth of Vermont. Um, we're a multi-generational program that provides um, early childhood education for young children, and then also at the same time, provides social services for their families. So um, under the umbrella of Head Start, there is Head Start, which serves three to five-year-olds, and Early Head Start, which serves pregnant mothers through three. So we have, um, a, we serve across the young spectrum. For children, our services are designed to promote school readiness. Um, and they include things like early childhood education, uh, health, nutrition, mental health supports, and other services for children with special needs. And for um, their families, we provide social services in order to work to stabilize those families. Um, we set up, we work with them to develop their own goals and we help them work toward those which in some cases may be getting a college degree and other cases may just be maintaining their housing. You know, we have folks at, at all different, we individualize by wherever they're at. Um, we, um, each Head Start program is uniquely structured so all of the programs in Vermont have what we call center-based care that you might think of as child care. But there also are some Head Start programs that work in collaboration with elementary schools to have a classroom in an elementary school or may work um, in partnership with private child cares to have slots in private child cares and support the child care to improve their um, quality. And then lastly, we have home visiting programs and some of the Head Start programs. And any given Head Start program could have any combination of those services available, but they all have center-based childcare. Um, we um, provide um, 
really high quality research-based programs. All of our curriculums are research-based, whether it's the curriculum for the children or the curriculum for the family. And um, we have a proven, proven positive outcome with children that we serve, most notably in the level of education they attain as they grow older and the incarceration rates for past Head Start graduates. So that is sort of my opening. Do you wanna um, ask me some of the questions? Um, certainly, um, I'm gonna start with, and maybe I didn't hear it clearly um, enough. Uh, what is, at, at what age do you, um, in terms of the center-based care as opposed to the home case, at what age do you be, do, does, do most Head Start programs start accepting children? So I believe, and this is gonna be my, my best knowledge, but I think there are three of us that start at six weeks, and then there are four that start at three years old. Okay. Thank you. Um, you want me to go through the questions that yeah, you sent out? That would be great. Thank Why you. Why don't I do that? So um, you asked, um, you know, academic research says that advanced degrees are very important in childcare. What has been your practical experience? My experience is that yes, higher education does result in um, better quality service, um, particularly in in the teacher's understanding of where the child is developmentally and then their ability to put together and implement an appropriate um, lesson plan. So um, for example, in, in the area of literacy, if the majority of the class is working at the level of learning how to rhyme, a, a well-educated teacher can put together uh, an activity that really helps them learn rhyming, but then they also for that one or those one or two children that already have rhyming down pat, they can mix in a, a few things that will help them work on alliteration, which is the next step up. Or if they have children, a couple that are not ready to do rhyming yet, they can have things built in so that they can work on tapping out syllables, which is the level below. And so I think, um, you know, all those complexities about putting together the lesson plan for each of the many activities of the day, it's really helpful for you to really have a, a firm, solid understanding of child development, how to, how to advance child development, and to be able to observe your children and know what level they're at. Um, Representative, <laughs> sorry, uh, Representative Wood has a question. Okay. Thank you, Christy. Um, uh, I'm just curious in your um, in your experience in Head Start programs, are you able to hire professionals with uh, uh, at least a bachelor's degree, or um, and if if so, or if not, um, have your staff um, accessed the professional development that's been available through the department so far? We really struggle to find um, staff that have what we, because we like teachers to have a bachelor's degree and we do struggle to find those folks. Um, in the 1920 program year, I think the average um, time to hire when there was a vacancy in a teacher position for Vermont Head Starts was, I, I wanna say eight months. That's relying on my memory, but you know, it was a while. Mm -hmm. um, we do have some teachers that make use of the TEACH program. We also, as Head Starts, um, are, we are given separate funding to provide um, training for our staff that's separate from our operating budget. And we really try to help teachers grow and come along. So if you fire, hire someone with an associate's degree, we will pay part of their tuition to get them up to a bachelor's. But you know, as Allison mentioned, then often once we assist them with that, they move on to the public schools where they can make much more than we're able to offer. And are you able to offer um, any benefits to your staff? 
We do. So we have uh, optional medical and dental. We have a 401k that we offer a partial match on. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are things I'm forgetting, but yes, we do provide benefits. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, should I move on to question two? Yeah. Okay. So do you accept families who utilize the state's child care assistant? Yes, all, all Head Start programs. You know, we are, our, our whole reason for being is to provide early childhood education to children who are at risk. And so a great majority of the children that we serve are um, very low income. And so we um, accept child care subsidy. And um, to go on to the next section of that court, that section, we do not have a limit on how many um, enrolled children can accept child care subsidy. Um, Christy, do you, um, if the subsidy does not cover, for lack of a better term, what is charged every week? Then, then we eat that. Okay. <laughs> that's not a very eloquent way to say that, but that's a pretty blunt way to say, you know, okay. what happens. Um, but, and so is that, so you ask people, here is your copay or here is your piece. And if they choose to pay, fine. But if they don't, if they're able to pay, fine. But if they're not, you don't. Okay. Correct. Sometimes um, if, you know, if they have partial subsidy, we might ask them to um, work with one of our money coaches before we sign off on that. We um, at Capstone have a program through our community economic development program where one of the things they offer is, is coaching on money management. And so sometimes we will ask that, that before we, if you will, forgive that co-payment that they, go work with our money coach to find out if they really can afford it or if they can't. Okay. And then the last section of that question is, um, would changes in H-171 that expand the child care financial assistance program to lower income and middle income families improve access to your child care program? Absolutely, actually, because um, at Head Start, we really believe in having um, a diverse classroom, a mixed classroom. And what we often end up having is, is a classroom that's all very low on income children. And we would love to have a mix of, of socioeconomic background in those classrooms. But we often find that middle income families are not able to afford our services. So I, I think that would be a positive thing for all the way around if we were able to get those mixed classrooms. Should I move on to question three? Okay. What would the impact of being paid based on enrollment versus attendance have on your program? It would be huge for us. Um, Certainly the things that Allison spoke to um, in the long term around um, us continuing to be paid when a child is out sick for the week, um, things like that, or goes on vacation for a week would really be helpful for our, our planned budget. Um, but the other um, thing is in the short term during the pandemic, um, a lot of Head Start programs, and I'm sure many others, are um, really struggling um, with their budget because we are not uh, receiving as much in childcare subsidy as we have traditionally. So um, for Vermont Head, Head Starts um, across the state, um, they received $950,000 less in childcare subsidy than was anticipated between um, June, and the early June and the end of December. Um, there are a number of reasons for that. Um, the main one is that we have reduced some of our classroom sizes to be in alignment with the CDC recommendations. But another big piece of that is that 
We all have a number of families who are enrolled with us, but are not comfortable coming into in-person services right now. So what we're providing them with is um, virtual service. So every week we drop off a packet on their doorstep that has lots of activities and has the meals and snacks for the week. And then they once a week have um, a virtual, like a Zoom with their classroom teacher where they um, talk about the activities and they work with the parents to figure out how to make use of those activities over the course of the week. And then they have at least weekly check-in from our social services um, folks, sometimes much more than that. And in addition, as needed, we pull in um, an RN, a registered dietitian, a mental health consultant, dental hygienist, whatever that particular family needs. We're providing all of those services at the family's request, but we're not getting paid for that service because those children are enrolled, but they're not attending. And so that, that would help us out quite a bit in that regard. Should I move on to the next uh, question? Uh, Christy, you actually, we actually have two questions for you at this okay. juncture. Um, Teresa, uh, Representative Wood, and then following Representative Wood, Representative Redman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Christy, I was just uh, curious, uh, sort of in follow-up to Representative Brumstead's question from the last witness, um, were Head Start programs able to access the relief funds um, that were set out and uh, so is the figure that you gave of the 900 and some odd thousand dollars, um, it, were those at all offset by some of those um, programs or was that loss of revenue even after those programs? Yeah, that, that is the loss. I don't, I can't speak to other programs, but you know, the, the monies that we were able to obtain were significantly less than, than what we we're short. We were short, short about two hundred thousand dollars in my program, and you know we accessed, you know, maybe five thousand dollars worth of of state assistance for the pandemic. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Representative Redmond, followed by Representative Rosenquist. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a question about the enrollment base versus the attendance. I, I'm, I'm trying to kind of get under that and understand what the impact for a Head Start program would be going to that enrollment base. Um, do you have a sense of like where, what could that allow you to do? Where could that money be directed? Um, would you be able to pay staff more? You know, like what, what obviously it's going to fill a big hole, but I, I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of like, you know, what, what are we talking about for like a Head Start organization? What does that mean to go to an enrollment based system versus attendance? Right. It it likely would mean a little bit more income for us in the in the long term because of because when children are, are out and you know we generally have a few children who have special health needs that cause them to be out for a week not not that infrequently and so we have to pay staff less because our income is less during that you know because we don't have consistent income we make more some weeks than others so we can't pay our staff at the rate we otherwise would be able to do. So, so just, so it means you can employ people more regularly, more consistently, um, you know, more full time that, that it would contribute to that. I think it would not contribute to that because whether we have 10 kids in a classroom or 15 kids in the classroom, we need the same staffing, but what it would allow us to do is to provide a more adequate <laughs> wage. You know, mm -hmm. we could bump up their dollar per hour. Great, thank you. All right, I guess I'm up. Yeah, okay. yes. All right. hey, thanks. Just, uh, and this goes back to the last qu uh, the question before, and just wanted to make sure I understood. You said that 
you would like it if you could get a more mixed classroom as far as socioeconomic uh, diversity, if you will. Uh, and what part of the bill contributes best to that or in the best way? I, I think that it would expand eligibility to more middle income families and and some of the families, frankly, that that wouldn't be Head Start eligible based on income, but are but get partial subsidy, they can't afford to pay the partial subsidy to join our our centers. And so if we could if they didn't have that cost burden, it would be much easier to get a mix. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Christy, if you could continue, that would be great. Okay, great. So um, the next question is for, and I have to be honest, I didn't understand um, what you folks were looking for with that question. Um, when you submit your program's information to the state for the market rate survey, what do you submit and how do you come up with the figure? We don't, uh, we don't participate in a market rate survey. Are you maybe thinking about what we, what we post in BFIS? I'm not sure what. No, 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 uh, that, that um, you answered the question. <laughs> okay. Is, which is you don't participate in um, the market rate survey that the department goes through. So thank you. Oh, well, it would be good if, if we were a part of that. Now, I know that's not in your bailiwick, but um, because we do try to have some slots for, um, for children that are enrolled outside of Head Start so that um, we can get that mix of children. So, you know, we do have numbers that we could provide for that. But, okay, I'll move on to number five then. <laughs> If your program takes children zero to three, what does a typical day look like? We do take children zero to three in my program, um, in our program. Um, we have two infant rooms and two toddler rooms and, and their days look different from each other. So the infant rooms, um, we follow their routine. We don't create the routine. So when they're tired, they take a nap. When they're hungry, we feed them. You know, when they're ready to play, then we provide play activities. So it, it really looks like each child um, doing what is their biological need at that time. And we try to put in, mix in as much one-to-one -one interaction with their teachers as possible, and as well as developmentally appropriate books and toys. And of course, once they start to be crawlers, we provide a lot of motor activity opportunities. <laughs> once they get busy. Um, in toddler classrooms, we have a flexible routine, again, based on their basic needs, um, you know, eating, toileting, sleeping. Um, but we do begin to do some group activities with toddlers. So that may just be reading a book together. It may be playing Play-Doh at the same table, but the, the expectations are age appropriate, you know, so if, if somebody comes over and looks at the Play-Doh and says, no, I don't want to do that, and they leave, that's okay. That, you know, that's, that's what's appropriate for that age level. So it's pretty flexible. Thank you. If you could, um, I don't see any uh, questions around that. So if you could, um, that helps. Uh, if you could go to the next question. Okay. So, what do you think about the concept of the state setting the lowest amount you would be allowed to pay an employee of your program? Mm -hmm. I so think basically the state requiring you have to pay at least this. Right. I, I think it's absolutely needed as long as childcare subsidy is, is helping folks to be able to do that. Um, you know, so if, if it were say child to, to childhood, accepting childhood care subsidy, then that would be great. Um, I think there's a real shortage in Vermont, but countrywide um, of early childhood educators. We really um, need more folks to go into that program. Um, I believe that there are a lot of folks out there that would be fantastic early childhood educators and would really enjoy and thrive in the work. 
but who do not choose to go there because it doesn't make a lot of sense to get a college degree and take on the college debt that's likely associated with that in order to make just over minimum wage. Um, so that's a nut we have to crack. And I, I think this would be a good way to start, as was said before, chipping away at that issue. Thank you. And um, you're being very helpful and really appreciate it. And the final, I believe that's the, um, the final question. Um, that would be sort of, um, what's the state doing well? Oh, um, what's the state stop doing and what ideas do you have? But before you go to that last question, um, we do have a um, um, representative from Stead has a question. Okay. You can finish up and then I'll ask my question at the end because maybe it'll come in this one. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one thing that the state could do to improve um, our, their interaction with us um, and, and our, support our business and our children is, um, is that move to be subsidy based on enrollment rather than attendance. I'm gonna sneak in another one though to say it would be great in the short term if they could provide us assistance, childcare subsidy could provide us assistance for those classrooms that were running at lower capacity in order to um, maintain what's recommended by the, by the CDC. So for our, I'll just use us for an example. We are, um, have been serving our preschoolers, the three to five year olds. Um, we just split the class in half. So we're serving everybody. We do half of the children on Monday and Tuesday and the other half we see on Thursday and Friday. So we're serving the full numbers even if it's not ideal um, that they're just getting two days a week. But for um, infants and toddlers, we just couldn't bring ourselves to do that because it's so inappropriate for that age group to have that lack of routine that we have cut our, our numbers. Um, so we're only serving in each of our infant and toddler classrooms. We're serving as many children as can sleep and still have their heads six feet apart when they're laying down. And <laughs> it's what we're using as, as our, our attempt to, to meet the recommendations because we know we shouldn't have all of those kids moving around together. So if they could support us just through the pandemic um, to be able to follow those guidelines, that would be wonderful. Um, one thing the state should stop doing, I don't know that I was able to come up with anything for that. Um, and one thing that the state should keep doing um, I really value the culture of the Child Development Division, CDD, and that they really understand that their um, primary stakeholder is children and families. And I would really like to see that preserved. Do you want me to go? <laughs> Thank you very much, Christy. That was really interesting. Um, I just have two quick questions. I hope maybe they're not. Um, one is, if you were to think about a typical week when we're not in a pandemic, you know, back before that, which now to me anyway, seems like a lifetime ago. Um, if you were to think, if, you, if we were to switch to enrollment versus attendance, how many um, of your children, I mean, how much would that impact a week? Is there that many absences in a week? Do you see where I'm going with this? I do see where you're going. There aren't that many absences um, in a given week. We do though often have certain children for whom because of their medical situation, they are frequently out for a week at a stretch. And so um, there certainly are occasions where it is a little painful. Okay, and then my other question is totally not not in that same vein, but is, um, and maybe you've already told us this, I sneezed for a while and missed a little bit. Um, did, what do you, what are you able to pay a bachelor prepared 
um, new provider at this point? Is it just, you said something about just a little over minimum wage? No. Right, so we um, start with subs at about $14.50 an hour, but that doesn't mean that they, that isn't bachelor level. We also have teacher A's who come in at either a CDA or an associate's degree. And I think they start at 15. Um, and then a teacher with their bachelor's or master's will start out at around 16 and can go all the way up to 18. And is that a salary or do you pay them by? No, that, no, no I, I mean hourly. That's the hourly rate. Sorry, I should have specified. No, I, I understood that it wasn't, but I just meant, do you get, do they get a pay even no matter how much they work in a week, for example, but I guess. Um, we pay, we pay based on the number of hours they work, but they almost are always work exactly 40 hours a week. It's, okay. it's unusual for a situation to arise where they work fewer or more. Thank you. Sorry, Christy, I was having trouble unmuting. Um, it doesn't look like we have other, oh, I'm sorry, it does look like we have another question. But Representative Rosenquist, you're up at the corner. I didn't see you. I and wonder now, what I'm doing up there, okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, I was just wondering what, what you were talking about, the child development uh, division and that you like that group, and there is some talk about eventually moving uh, child uh, development, if you will, into the Department of Education. So you would you like that or you would not like that or you'd like it to stay where it is now? I, I think it's working well where it is right now. I don't know enough to say what I think about moving it to the Department of Education. I, I, I'm hoping to find out more about that on Monday when there'll be a presentation on that at, at, BF, at BBF. Thank you. Sorry, pressing the space bar did not work. Uh, so I apologize. Um, Christy, thank you. This has been really very, uh, really very, very helpful um, to us. And thank you for spending the time. And uh, Head Start is an, a program that we all think is really important. Um, well, thank you for having me. Great. Um, now, next we are, um, our, our next uh, witness is, uh, uh, Marsha uh, uh, Far um, um, Farinaris, and uh, so Marsha, I'm going. You can correct my pronunciation. I do apologize, um, and uh, please go ahead. And you are on mute. Okay, Madam Chair, you're not the first to mispronounce that last name. It's Farinaris, so thank you. Bereni Ars. yes. Bereni Ars. Yeah. So hello, my name is Marcia Bereni Ars, and I am the interim CEO at the Greater Burlington YMCA. I've been with the Y for 39 years and my titles and positions have changed, but the vast majority of my experience is in school age and early child care. I've served the state in various capacities around child care to include being part of various uh, Building Bright Futures committees, serving on the Governor's Child Care Advisory Board, which was the predecessor of Building Bright Futures, and helping to create the first set of licensing regs for school age programs in the state. Um, the Y serves just over 200 children in its early child care programs. Approximately half of those children are infants and toddlers. We have four locations, two in downtown Burlington, one in St. Albans, and we have a partnership with the UBM Medical Center to provide care at a Winooski Bay Center for Medical Center employees. I did receive your questions in advance and in my testimony, I believe I've addressed each one. I of course welcome your questions. 
Before diving in, I wanna thank the committee for the opportunity to, to testify and express my sincere appreciation for time, attention, and energy that's being dedicated to the incredibly important issue of early child care and education. Thank you. I will start by stating what you've heard that one of our biggest challenges at the Y and across the state is finding and retaining qualified staff to work in our early childhood education programs. It's not so much a problem for the Y as it is for the over 100 infants on our waiting list looking for care um, not at our downtown facility and for families all across Vermont. We are desperately trying to open two more infant classrooms in one of our two Burlington locations, but we can't. We simply can't get enough qualified applicants to fill our head teacher positions. Professionals are leaving the field as they can't afford to work in early childcare. We need to incentivize staff to not only come into the field, but to remain. For that to happen, I think they need to be paid commensurate with other educators in the public sector, and they need opportunities for advanced degrees. Our experience is that those who come to us with advanced degrees are our future center head teachers, assistant directors, directors. They're committed to the fields, they have the education and experience commensurate with what's needed in early child care to run high quality programs. Two of my center directors currently hold those master degrees. The reality is that in order for us to pay our staff commensurate with their K-12 peers, we have to have financial support from the state. Families simply cannot afford to pay out of pocket the true cost of care and subsidy currently falls well short of that cost. At the Y, we're fortunate in that we have a development team who's tasked with raising funds in the community to help support families to access many of our Y programs. The biggest chunk of the money we raise goes to early childhood care. 31% of the families we serve are families receiving state subsidy. We currently do not cap the number of families we serve who receive this subsidy because to turn families away seems antithetical to the Y mission. That said, it's a conversation we have had many times when we're talking about our ability to remain financially viable. Currently every week, the Y subsidizes our families on subsidy to the tune of approximately $4,000. That's weekly. This includes families who utilize our Burlington and St. Albans centers. As an example, allow me to share that our tuition cost for infant care is currently $389 a week. A family who qualifies for 100% subsidy will receive state support in the amount of $238.94, leaving a difference of $117.60 from the rate we charge. And again, what we charge does not cover full cost. Um, the family simply cannot afford to cover the weekly gap. And after arranging for a manageable payment for the family, which may be $5 a week, the Y is left to cover through scholarship the remaining balance. The amount the Y covers to help ensure families who receive, receive state subsidy, can, that, that families can receive this subsidy to access high quality care can be even greater due to other factors. This gets to that question of payment for enrollment versus attendance. There are some dollars that are tied to days we don't get paid if families need to take a significant number of days off. And now we have families, if you wanna travel, you have to quarantine. So often there's families who need to take a lot of time. So yeah, there are dollars that we don't receive because families weren't there. We don't receive dollars if we close beyond the number of days that the state says we're permitted. We need to have training days, it's important that you know staff have not just what's mandated, we go above and beyond because we have children with a lot of issues coming into our center and our staff need to be trained to work with them and their families. We close for holidays and we close for a week at Christmas so staff can get a much needed break. And if you add in snow days, often we will go beyond. But I think it's bigger than just the dollar figure I think administratively, it can be a nightmare. My staff have to actually have conversations with these families about why were you out yesterday? Why did you miss three days? Was it a vacation? Was it a sick day? They have to track it. It's, you know, we don't want families to worry about it. 
but we have to know because we have to track it, turn it in, turn it into the state. And there's a lot of administrative hours that go in into doing all of that reporting. These are families who are on the edge. They may be experiencing food and housing insecurity in addition to their childcare challenges. So why add to their burden by putting restrictions on how they use that care? A family that uses Y early childcare that does not need state subsidy, but rather pays the full amount, can take as much time off as they want and secure their spot because they can afford to pay for it. The system as it currently exists puts undue stress and worry on subsidy families should events out of their control dictate the need for them to have to be absent. That they will lose their childcare should not be a worry they have to think about and they should not have to call the centers in the state to ask for variances. The why is in the scheme of things fortunate. We're an organization with a business office and center directors who don't have to be in the classrooms every day. Although lately with our inability to hire staff, that's not the case as much. I have no idea how smaller centers or any home-based childcare programs can find the resources necessary to serve families receiving state subsidy. The financial burden of providing care to these families should not fall on the providers and families. And if you expand the CCFAP to lower and middle income families, there has to be increased funding to the providers so they can afford to provide the care. Again, at the Y, we have scholarship dollars to help these families who are kind of on the edge. But so there will be more who will qualify, but again, we will still be subsidizing them. The Y is uniquely positioned to be able to provide scholarship dollars and we still struggle. Most centers and home-based care cannot afford to face the financial hits of below market subsidy rates and high administrative costs. An additional consideration that must not be overlooked is the fact that an investment in early care and education of children through high quality programs will certainly lead to savings down the road. We, unlike K through 12, see our families every day. We're in constant communication about the development and well being of their children. We know if a child isn't coming with enough food, we know if a family is in need of housing. We can identify if a child's experiencing any trauma at home as we have eyes on them every day. And we know the earlier we can intervene to help families and children, the better chance that they'll have a success and maybe avoid costs down the road when they enter public education. We also know brain development is critical in the early years. Our infants are not just getting basic care every day. Our staff ensure they receive dedicated time for songs, and books each day to work on literacy. They work on spatial awareness, problem solving. How do I get that toy? What will that toy do? Gross motor and fine motor opportunities to build their skills and muscles so they can roll, then sit, then crawl, then walk. And for infants, everything is new. They're little scientists all day long. They're learning how something new relates to what they already know. They're constantly exploring and expanding their minds and a high quality program maximizes on that opportunity. Lastly, you asked us three questions. What can the state do to improve your interaction and support your business and children? I went to my staff, I went to the business office and they said the same thing, improve the existing BFIS system. That would help significantly. They currently see it as unreliable and complicate to complicated to navigate. Uh, one thing the state should stop doing, again, I went to my team, um, just to limit or bring to an end the, unique, the undue burden on families and providers created by ever increasing and changing regulations, processes and procedures and inadequate subsidies. What's the one thing the state should keep doing? That was easy, keep making investments in early childcare. And I've been so appreciative in the past years. You know, I've been here for 39 years in childcare. I have seen investments over the past years and I thank you um, because it helps, but I'm sure you know, it's not enough, we need more. It might help one area, but certainly doesn't help us in another. I'm really encouraged by this bill. It comprehensively addresses the many challenges facing early care and education of children. I wanna thank you so much for the work you've done to date, your support of this bill and the heavy lifting that I know will come. 
There's nothing more important than um, ensuring families and children have the supports they need to be successful. And simply put, high quality childcare is essential. It's what every young child needs to support their growth and what parents need in order to work and then contribute to a vital Vermont economy. So I thank you all for your time and happy to answer any of your questions. Marcia, thank you. Thank you very much for the clarity and the thoughtfulness. Um, and for the years of history that you've put <laughs> to the YMCA and stepping up to be uh, interim executive director, perhaps when that wasn't really what you were expecting to do as um, that. No, um, but thank you. Um, we have um, uh, questions or comments from four um, folks. Um, and we'll start with Representative uh, Redman. We will go to Representative Rosenquist, then Representative Brumstead, and then Representative Wood. And um, committee, as I am having trouble muting and unmuting at a quick level. Um, if you can just go one after another, that would be work good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Marcia. Um, a question for you. You mentioned um, one of the onerous things is uh, involving the changing procedures and regulations and, and, and that whole process. And, you know, that obviously as, um, you know, these, you know, the way that we serve children evolves, of course, those things are going to change it. I'm, I wanted to understand more what you were referring to that we could change as a state on our end, that's onerous for you. Yeah. So, you know, some examples go back a little bit, um, unintended consequences, the whole act 166 and the burden it put on providers, just the paperwork, the administration of it, the, and then the rules kind of kept changing and keeping up with that. And I think it felt, I can only speak for the childcare provider community that sometimes the, it, it, you know, the burden was falling on us to have to change our ways and do all this, all these things differently with little notice. Um, you know, recently came out a mandate for fingerprinting and this probably came fit from the federal um, level, I'm sure that we were going along fine with the fingerprinting and all that was happening. And now we found out that our out of state employees all of a sudden need an additional level of background check, which meant immediately we could not leave them alone with children. So we're, we're understaffed as it is, and now we're having to reconfigure how we can stay in ratio, but this person can't be with a group of children in this. So I think those are the kind of things they refer to. Um, yeah. Thank you, Marsha. I think you were very comprehensive in uh, how you addressed all those questions. Mine was, I'm, I'm terrible with initials. So you mentioned one of the things you'd like to see, uh, how should I say, less of is the BIF system. And maybe that's what you were just referring to. I'm not sure. But what's BIF stand for? BFIS is the um, Bright Futures Information System, um, which is a system that we have to go in to track our professional, um, you know, what our staff have done professionally. I think the business office use it. I don't use it myself, so I can't speak completely about all the uses, but BFIS is something that my staff have to, um, they have to enter their credentials, any trainings they take. It tells us where our licenses are at. It, I believe the business systems office uses it for various items, but it's your main software program. And you're saying that's, that's uh, a lot of work to do and it's not worth, worth much to you at, the, at that level, right? I think it's, I think they're finding it unreliable. It's somewhat outdated. Information isn't always kept up to date. So we think we're good in one area and then we find out we're not. It just wasn't updated in the system. So I have heard um, many concerns about that system. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marsha, very much. I am, um, you should know that hopefully it's, we feel that um, we've put some money aside for improving that BFIS system and hopefully there's help on the way. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> um, I, um, 
and and I also want to thank you because two of my grandchildren go to the YMCA and they love it. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have some questions and I appreciate that you put out the numbers. Um, and I have a couple of questions around it. Your first statement when you were talking about that was um, that the charge is less than the cost. And I'm curious if you have any sense of what the cost is for a child zero to three to be there for a week compared right. to this $389. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Representative Brumstead. I don't have that exact number. It is north of $400. Um, and I don't have that. I could certainly get you a more accurate number and would be happy to forward that to you. Um, but what we currently charge is not the cost when we look at our program. Um, okay. No program okay. stands on its own. Yeah, that would be great to know, yes. you know, as we look at, at uh, costs across the state. Um, also, if you're, if you, if you have one child there, that's one price, the 389, but if you have two, you have a little bit of a um, discount or no? There's no discount for second child, but it does go down as the ratios go down as we serve children. So infants are the most expensive. That's a one to three staff to child ratio. And then as children get older, the, the numbers can decrease a little bit. By the time they get to preschool, it's very different. So okay. it's based okay. on, a lot of it is staffing. I mean, the biggest expense in most childcare programs is staffing. Great, and, and just one last question. Sure. The bachelor prepared teacher, I, I've asked this question a couple of times today, what would a bachelor prepared teacher make working at the YMCA? So the Y has put some significant investment in what we pay staff because we had to, to remain viable. We, we, weren't, we were losing staff left and right to public schools. They were leaving. So currently a teacher with a bachelor's degree, I'm, I'm, it's great, makes 20 an hour. And we do salary. Most of our teachers are salaried. There's great benefits that come um, when you work at the Y, a generous paid time off program, medical, dental, retirement. Um, but that $20 an hour is not what a public school teacher would make. Okay, great. Thank you very, very much. Yes, thank you. Um, thanks for being here, Marcia. Really appreciate the thoroughness of your testimony today. Um, and I had a chance to um, visit your um, new facilities back when we the the ribbon cutting happened. It was it was they're great. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, so my my question I have a couple of questions. Um, so when you submit your information for the uh, market rate survey, what what information are you submitting? Are you submitting your true cost? Or are you submitting what you charge? What we charge. What you charge. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then my second question is we've had, um, uh, actually, I think all of the witnesses so far this afternoon have mentioned the uh, BFIS system. And um, it just occurred to me, I, um, you know, there, there is a module already under development for Im improving that system. And uh, have as the end users um, have, has the state reached out to you for your input regarding um, changes in BFAS in terms of how you would use it and you know how you would think that that would be helpful? You know, Representative Wood, they haven't reached out to me, but they wouldn't. They may have reached out to my directors and I will ask them um, who use the system every day. And I can certainly get back to you with that. Um, I don't know that they if they've reached out or not, but I can find that out and I can let you know. Thank you. That that would be helpful. And um, I don't know if the other two witnesses can answer that question because it seems to make sense to if we're if we're putting in a new system to ask the end users uh, who interface with it on a daily basis how they are experiencing it and what are the things that would make the most sense. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. And if there are no further, I think Teresa and others said it um, well. Thank you very much. Um, Christy, um, you are next, but I'm wondering if you are not in a time crunch, I would love for you to be our final um, witness. And I would like to be able to um, uh, we got testimony that the person is not able 
um, that we had asked, we, we had asked uh, Representative Rosenquist to uh, find testimony. Oh, sorry, uh, Samara, I'm sorry. I, Sam, Samara, are you able to stay? Um, yeah. You are? Uh, yes, yes, I can stay. Okay, good. Um, uh, committee, uh, represent, um, we had asked, we, uh, the Royal We, Representative Wood and I had asked um, Representative Rosenquist to, to uh, try to find a registered home provider um, to provide input. And um, uh, while we have um, gotten it, um, I think in our email, um, I think it, I, I wanna respect Repre um, Representative Rosenquist's work and getting it and um, either I will read it or um, Representative Rosenquist, you can read the testimony from that that was that you so that you got for us. All right. Uh, what I prefer to do would be because uh, how how we uh, couched those questions. I didn't ask her those questions, so she wouldn't have asked those things specifically. So what I'd rather do is get her. Uh, address, which I don't have right at the moment, okay, and have uh, Julie send her those questions and get answers to those directly. And okay. Then we'd, read, then we'd read that at uh, the next get together on this if we could. Does that okay. sound reasonable? Okay. That sounds very reasonable. Um, committee, her testimony right now is on the committee um, webpage and um, uh, I don't um, think she touched on all the, all the areas right. that you identified and I'd like her to be able to do absolutely. that. Absolutely, absolutely. She touched on a lot, but absolutely. And um, uh, Representative Rosenquist, we do have her email address. And so we can email the questions to her. Oh, that would be fantastic. You do have that, right? I wonder how I missed it. Okay. Uh, um, you you just have to go down the email that you got. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still learning. You know, oh, I, um, uh, please, I, I'm having trouble getting mute and unmute. So we are all learning here. Um, Madam okay. Chair, quick question. What name yes. should we be looking for um, in finding the testimony that has already been submitted? Um, Tammy Dodge. Thank you. So would Julie send those questions then to Tammy and ask her to respond or uh, do them? That would be great if she could do that. Okay. I am confident. Um, that Julie probably has already done it as we have had this conversation. Um, but, and she will do it. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, Samara, thank you. Are you still there, Samara? Or oh. did you? <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I'm here. I was just seeing out my last teacher of the day. Okay, so, no, uh, you know, you. But you had work to do? Just, yeah, multitasking a little bit. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for multitasking and thank you for taking the time to um, to help us figure out what people in the field think and how we're going to uh, um, think about the bill that is in front of us. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. I'm really grateful for this opportunity opportunity to provide testimony. Um, I do have some prepared, uh, a prepared statement that I'd like to read, um, but also by way of an introduction, um, I'm the owner director and the preschool teacher at Montpelier Children's House. We're a five-star program. It's also an Act 66, 166 participating provider. My dad started this program in 1984, first as a home program before moving to Berry Street, Montpelier. This past winter, we had an opportunity to move our program to Mountain View Street. The Love Works program was closing this location and National Life found themselves seeking a new tenant. With a Make Way for Kids grant, we were able to grow our program from preschool only to include children from birth to three. Our new space has capacity for up to 44 children, but we are currently at capacity at 30 children due to health and safety concerns during COVID and also due to uh, staffing challenges. Right now we're working to open a desperately needed infant and toddler room. I have a long waiting list and get new calls every week. The barrier to making this happening, to making this happen is finding qualified staff. I took a quick look at the Vermont Early Childhood Jobs Board and was disheartened to see I was among many, many programs trying to hire staff right now. 
Of my 30 families, 18 have their tuition reduced by Act 166 funds and four received CC, receive CCFAP. There are eight teachers total at Children's House, two hold an associate's degree, five have a bachelor's, and three of us hold a current educator's license. Um, and I went ahead and just answered the questions as posed. Um, the first one about um, academic research says that advanced degrees are very important. My response is that my practical experience is that holding a degree is often, but not always important in providing high quality childcare. I have had teachers with stellar credentials and little practical experience who were not effective teachers and others with a handful of community college credits who had spent many years in the field who were magical in the classroom. I'd love to see those amazing teachers without degrees be supported to more easily be able to convert their experience into credentials so that they could advance in the field, especially as we move toward a future state where early educators are paid well and their expertise is recognized. In my experience, based on what I'm able to pay, it can be very difficult for people with degrees to be able to work for me. At one point, I was hiring for a licensed teacher for our preschool and interviewed a highly qualified, enthusiastic recent graduate. Early on in the interview, it was revealed that she would need to earn at least $25 an hour to make her student loan payments, something that was far beyond the reach of my program. It is my experience that for many educators holding a degree or a license, a job in the public school system makes far more financial sense for them and enjoy, they enjoy a higher rate of pay and benefits that I simply cannot offer. As an Act 166 provider, we are required to have a licensed teacher on staff for our preschool classroom. And in the end, I decided to get my own teaching license through the peer review process because I knew that finding and paying a licensed teacher would be a constant struggle. Additionally, I struggled to find and retain qualified teachers with any level of educational attainment. The wages are low, particularly in relation to the ongoing training requirements. The work is incredibly rewarding, but it is hard. And working with groups of children, particularly the very young, there are a few minutes of downtime. There are far easier ways to learn a similar wage and teacher burnout in ed early education is very real. Um, in response to the second question about accepting families who util utilize childcare assistance, um, we have always accepted families who utilize CCFAP. We do not have a cap on the number of children from those families. And that said, we could reach a point where this could become financially challenging. Payments are received weeks after care is provided. And this is the same with Act 166 tuition. And after a point, we would need to find a line of credit to bridge the, cap, the gap between care provided and payments received. Changes in H-171 that expand CCFAP to lower and middle income families would absolutely improve access to my program. Full-time enrollment for an infant is nearly $1,200 a month. And for many families, this is prohibitively expensive. In response to the question of what would the impact of being paid based on enrollment versus attendance have on my program? Being paid based on enrollment versus attendance would have a tremendous impact on our program and for our families. This past summer, when the state shifted back to paying based on attendance, when programs were encouraged to reopen, I had a child who received CCFAP funds, whose family had a school-aged child for whom they could not find care, as was the case with many school-aged children this past summer. This family also struggled with adequate transportation. And because CCFAP provides only so many allowable days of absence, this family was faced with paying the full cost of a day of childcare or finding a way for their daughter to get to school when they had no other reason to leave home. And at this point, this was not the best option for the family. By paying based on enrollment, families receiving CCFAP are able to make the same choices about their child's attendance as those not receiving funds. It's simply a matter of equity. Um, Question four, when I submit uh, our program's information to the state for the market rate survey, we submit, um, at this time I submit what we charge our families. Um, that said, I have had many conversation with, conversations with my local directors group when it came time to update rates in the system. And we all struggled with knowing that what we're charging families doesn't come close to covering the true cost of care that we provide, but that it didn't feel right to publicize a rate that's so far out of reach for so many families. And right now it's programs and staff that are subsidizing the system by working for such low, low wages and with few or any benefits. Um, my program does now take birth to three-year-old children, um, which is new to us. And um, 
uh, what a typical day looks like, I'm providing a dramatic reenactment for you. Um, I got to spend some time in the classroom yesterday, and so um, uh, a little vignette. Um, it's arrival time. Paige greets baby T outside the front door with an open smile and he smiles back, really revealing a new tooth poking out. After a brief ex exchange with his dad, he goes into her open arms as Paige hefts both the baby and all of his daily supplies back into the classroom. As they enter the classroom, they are greeted by the joyful squeals of toddlers as they walk up the stairs and then run down the ramp of the low loft. T's eyes follow them as they move purposely through the classroom, navigating the space. You see Peter running up the ramp. He is so fast. Alana sits close by on the floor and moves in quickly as Peter greets another child with a two-handed shove. His playmate sits on the ground, upset and stunned. Ouch, she says softly, I bet that didn't feel good. He crawls into her lap for comfort. She turns to his playmate who stands close by. Do you want to play, she signs. With her hands, Peter signs play back with a big smile and runs off to get a ball, which he hands to his playmate, who smiles back. They both move away to play with the ball together. Amidst the sounds of the room, Paige sings a made up song as she changes T's diaper, letting him know what she's about to do. And so the day goes in constant motion with love, care and intention through caregiving routines supporting growing play skills, learning how little bodies can crime, crawl, climb, and navigate, making sense of the world as it emerges around them. To a person off the street, it would look like a fun day of play and nurturing. And in fact, every interaction is intentionally structured to support brain development and aligns with a planned curriculum intended to support the whole child. Um, in response to question six about um, my thoughts on the concept of the state setting the lowest amount I would be allowed to pay an employee in my program, um, I would be absolutely open to this, but there would need to be money coming from somewhere other than the tuition coming out of parents' pockets. Parents are stretched by the cost of childcare, and my program is barely getting by, and the economics simply do not work right now. Um, and for the final three questions. Um, as someone who is doing the work, I wear a lot of hats in early education. Um, I'm a small business owner. I am the program director. Um, I'm a classroom teacher um, among all of my other tiny roles in the program. Um, if I were to identify one thing that the state could do to improve your interaction with them and support my business and the children. I run a small program. I'm a small program and I'm the full-time administrator in addition to many other roles. Program administration, particularly around Act 166 and CCFAP, take a lot of my time. Making programs less administratively cumbersome would be tremendously helpful. I was unable to apply for the last round of much needed COVID grant funding because I simply did not have enough waking hours in my day to get the application done. One thing that, oh, and I also wanted to piggyback, um, Improvements to the BFIS system would be tremendous um, just in streamlining the, the time that I do have to spend um, in making that more effective and efficient. Um, one thing the state should stop doing. The state should stop putting the financial burden of accessing childcare and being a childcare provider on families and caregivers. Act 166 has made a huge difference for my families who are eligible. It's a great start for many but for many high quality child care remains out of reach. Child care providers do this work because it is heart work. We do it because we love what we do and we know that is some of the most important work to be done. The trade-off is that many of us sacrifice our own financial stability to work in a profession with very low wages, even for teachers who hold a degree. Many programs, including my own, cannot afford to provide benefits and many teachers are uninsured or underinsured which is particularly unsettling as we are in very close contact with children during the pandemic. And from a very personal perspective, owning and operating a childcare program is not the best financial choice for my own family. Both my husband and I are self-employed. He carves granite in Barrie, and neither of us can access employer-sponsored health insurance. And what this means is that we pay a total of $32,000 each year to buy insurance on the exchange. My youngest child is a type one diabetic and we meet our hefty out of pocket expenses by early summer each year. The state could stop forcing the hundreds of self-employed childcare educators around the state from having to purchase health insurance on our own at prohibitively expensive rates that are out of often out of reach. 
And lastly, what is the one thing the state should keep doing? Keep giving your attention to the importance of childcare for the healthy development of our youngest Vermonters and for the huge role that childcare plays in the Vermont economy. Keep working to make it possible for early educators to earn degrees and further their education without taking on a financial burden that cannot be repaid by comparatively low wages. And keep talking to and listening to program directors and administrators to understand how hard it is to balance the true cost of high quality childcare, the perennial challenges of staffing and the financial burden of the cost of child care for Vermont families. Thank you so much for the opportunity to provide this testimony. Samara, thank you. Um, and committee, uh, Samara's testimony is also um, on our committee webpage, um, as it is for anyone who wants to access it, who is listening to your eloquent and thorough testimony. Um, we have a question from Representative Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Samara. And I, re I really want to um, particularly thank you for this last comment regarding uh, the cost of health care uh, and insurance for your family. Um, I, I just want to, I guess, make a comment about that because I too have a, a, a home family care uh, provider who contacted me with that same concern and um, wishing for some some way to uh, attack that issue. Um, and right now her family is not able to afford to, to pay for any insurance. So they're living without a family of five living without health insurance, which worries me. Um, so um, thank you for, um, for highlighting that um, both for yourself and, and for my constituent too. Um, could, um, could you just um, answer the question that I asked previously about, have you uh, received any um, requests for uh, input from the Child Development Division regarding the changes that are currently being made to the BFIS system? Have, you, have they uh, provided any opportunity for end users to, um, to give them some input? I am not aware of any opportunities. Um that I've been given to provide input, but that said, um, I am not a very timely reader and answerer of my emails. So there's a <laughs> possibility that that came through and I didn't see it. It, it probably would not have been recently it would because they've been working on this one for this, the current module for about a year. So um, yeah. for a little more. I don't um, believe so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Representative Wood. Uh, I believe that uh, Representative um, Brumstead has a question. And, Thank you. Um, and Representative Brumstead, before you uh, um, respond, um, we do, um, Christy Swenson um, um, is adding a comment. And Christy, um, just because we are, um, this is um, on YouTube, where we, um, I'm going to read your comment out loud. Um, and I would offer to, to any of the four of you who are still here, if you have a final or additional comment to raise your hand and we can um, uh, call on you then. But um, Christy's feedback is that she's confident that no one in her program has been asked to make any comment on the BFIS system. Telling. Yes. Yes, very. Very interesting. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Representative Wood, for starting us asking that question because it is very informative. Um, and thank you, Samara. So I, I just, your testimony was unbelievably interesting. And um, I loved your, your story of the day <laughs> that you added in. <laughs> um, it makes me miss my babies. Um, I, I'm asking everyone the same question. So I wanna be sure to ask you as well. What um, are you able to offer a bachelor um, teacher or, or is that just you? I, I was trying to pick up on the numbers at the beginning of your uh, testimony. Sure. Yeah, and I think um, my program has really committed to hiring as highly qualified teachers as we possibly can because we have struggled so much with turnover um, and, and really have made a priority to attract and retain, retain, um, qualified teachers. We pay our teachers with a bachelor's degree, $18 an hour. Um, 
That said, you know, we've been successful and we have this, this staff that I have right now is academically the most qualified as I've ever had in my history. It is killing us financially. Um, I am looking at our numbers at the beginning of the year. This has been an incredibly challenging year for us enrollment wise, which we've never experienced because families are, are having to make really hard decisions about if they can afford to keep their child in care, if they lose their job. Um, and so while our students and teachers enjoy a high level of, um, teacher qualification, as a, as a director, a program administrator, the, I, I'm having to make some really hard decisions about whether or not we can sustain that um, because of the cost. So I'm just curious, I, I asked this question earlier too, but that your comment just made me think of it as well. In the past, before the pandemic, um, in a typical week, how many absences would you, do you think you'd have in a group of, in one classroom, for example? So that would be, a smaller number. Well, they were all coming to school sick. So that, you know, that <laughs> one was at school. They, no one was gone. Um, you know, in a typical week, it was, um, we'd have a smattering of children out, but it wasn't, um, there weren't prolonged absences. Um, it was, you know, we didn't have many children out. And so when we were thinking earlier about enrollment versus attendance and the, the payment and then the payment of parents, most parents pay for the days that they're not there if they're not on CCFAP. Is that the same in your? Um... Absolutely. We, we simply could not cover the cost of days out um, if, if parents were, are not attending. We're very clear that if their child is not there, we still need, we're still paying our teachers. We still have our bills. We need to, we need to make our payments. Right. Right. Okay. So that's helpful. Thank you very much. Are there, um, committee, do you have, uh, is there anyone else who has a, uh, a question? Um, Samara, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh, really thank you, um, Samara and, um, uh, Christy and, Marsha and Samara, um, I'm sort of want to know if any one of the, uh, if any of you would like to uh, make any final comments. Please raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you for educating all of us and answering our questions, which may have seemed odd, but have really helped us um, hone in on some of the aspects of the bill. Um, so thank you, thank you very much. Um, and please um, feel free to stay on if you wish. Um, but we're gonna uh, begin to wrap up um, the committee and uh, move off from 171 and just do some committee business. So um, you're welcome to stay on, uh, Allison, Samara, Marsha, and Christy, but if you, have other things to do and kids to take care of, feel free to leave as well. Thank you. Um, committee, um, I've, now I have a mind like a sieve. Did I tell you 10 o'clock? No later, okay. No later than 10 o'clock tonight, you will um, <clears throat> get me your stuff. And, and um, Katie, if you um, get it by the time you wake up in the morning, I'm not going to ask you when. Will that give you um, um, enough time to get it to uh, um, members of the committee by 9.30 or so? Um, that will be tight if they're, okay. if, um, if they're short changes, then I won't have a problem doing that. It also, would you like it to go through editing? They're mm -hmm. expecting it tomorrow morning. Uh, um, I guess what, um, if it had, I mean, how's this, Katie? I was, you know, we're getting comments no later than 10. I could get them to you by, um, you know, depending on what they are, um, either by 10, 15 or 11. Um, because I'm working then does not mean that you have to. Um, so I, so what, what is realistic for you? to get it to us? 
Um, I'll, I'll do my best. I'll, I'll, I'll have it done. No, Katie, our, 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 perhaps our, our, anyway, our time frame and the fact that we didn't keep to our time frame does not, if you need more time, tell me. So, or no, that's a different way. What, um, when might you be able to, to give it to us so that, um, yeah. I think it totally depends on the, um, the extent okay. of the changes. I think if there are just a few word changes and changing a few sentences and it's very clear, then I could do that quickly and have it to you by um, maybe 9.30. If there are more extensive changes, I, I think I'm gonna need a little bit more time. Okay, okay. Then um, committee, we're going to be flexible. We are going to be flexible and um, uh, we have, Katie doesn't because she has other committees and other works work to do, but we have until um, we have until the afternoon to smoosh this into other things if need be before we um, and if you know and if yeah so we have that. Um, I also wonder: Is anyone here go to the women's caucus? Okay. Oh, good. Two of you go to the women's caucus. I happen to look at their agenda. And they're talking about the Office of Child Advocate. Um, and they are talking, um, uh, they're having someone, um, a provider from the Brattleboro area, um, speak about um, their thoughts as to what they understand the governor's proposal is around um, the organization of the, um, of of delivery of childcare, i.e. the, I'm trying to think of, I don't know how to frame this, the, um, the taking, the, having there no longer be a division of, of um, child development um, and moving those functions into other parts of state government, but as it relates to childcare. Um, I see Representative Rosenquist and then Representative um, Wood. Just a quick question. Uh, I know at one point you had asked us to rate uh, the priorities of our spending requests, if you will. Do, are we still supposed to do that or not? Are we waiting for this letter to be published first? Uh, um, um, Representative Rosenquist, what, what um, the majority of the committee um, came down to was um, that this was a unique year and we were not going to send the committee's top three priorities, but rather we were going to send, this is our comments on the governor's budget. And um, so do it that way. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, Representative Wood. Um, Madam Chair, I might have I might have missed this along the way. Oh, we 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 saw um, we saw the draft memo up on the screen, but I haven't seen it come through any place for us to comment on yet. That's what I wondered. So we can't really get you our comments if we haven't received the memo. You have you have provided. There is, um, I believe, that um, what we were working from. Oh, have we not, have I not sent it to you? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a problem. Um, okay. Yes, Katie. I have been editing all afternoon, so I have a new version, but I've just been waiting. It sounded like there are a few emails that didn't get to me. So as soon as I get those emails to finish up those um, last few little loose ends, then I could send you a clean copy to look at. Um, uh, Katie, okay. Um, um, I will send you what I have. And um, then if you wouldn't mind, is it fair to ask you to send something out to all the committee members? Yep, I'm happy to do that. Okay, so Katie's going to do that. And I will um, send those two. Um, it's the two emails around numbers I thought we were talking about, but- um, it was, and one of those, one of those, I believe you've gotten the, um, the update um, 
And I believe that was the only one. Um, so I think you can you can send out, I mean, that's what we're sort of doing this. Um, I think people need to see it as a, as a full. So if you could send that out to folks, can you send it out to folks not in a PDF? Sure, I'll send a Word version. I'll try to have it out in the next um, maybe 40 minutes or so, half hour to 40 minutes. Okay. And I know, Madam Chair, I know that for a few of us, like um, Kelly and I and Taylor and I, we're going to try and get this to you right away. So hopefully it won't but, be um, so late. I guess what I am, um, we, we, we picked a 10 o'clock time. I am, I, am, um, um, I am not going to be able to do anything for a period, for a block of time. I will not have access to a computer. Okay, I was just trying to be. Yeah, I, that's why I, thank you, thank you. So um, I guess Kate, Katie, um, Yeah, I will get. I will do the best I can in getting you stuff in the next few minutes. And this is a work in progress. Okay, um, uh, I think this ends the policy um, little update and how we're going from place A to place B around our comments to the budget um, and. Uh, this ends, we had a great, great afternoon. I like giving people questions. Sorry, um, we can talk about that later. <laughs> uh, and this ends uh, the House Human Services Committee meeting on February 18th.